If you're a visitor here, you will see that we are in a long sermon series on inner renewal. And we're looking at various aspects of what it means, now that I'm a child of God, what is expected of me. And the funny thing that is expected of me is I'm just expected to let the Holy Spirit work in me. Work with Him, but all with His power. And to become more and more like Jesus every day. I mean, if this wasn't necessary, if we died, He could have taken us straight to Himself. But there's a reason why we are here. There's a reason why He's still working in us. And we're looking at the moment at the spiritual gifts. And what we say time and time again. This is not just a journey where we want to learn about it. We have to learn about it. In 1 Corinthians 12, he says, you mustn't be uninformed. In other words, you are uninformed. Let me inform you. And that's the first purpose of this spiritual gift. There's so much deception in the church of what the spiritual gifts are and what they are not. That he's saying, let's get back to the word. Let's get back to what God says about that. And let go of things that might feel good and that I might have an emotional attachment to, but is not in line with his word. And that's a tough thing to do. That's tough to stand before God and say, God, but this really makes me feel so spiritual. And God says, but that's not in line with my word. So what you're feeling is a deceptive spiritual. It's not my spiritual. It's not my spirit doing this. And the definition we have for spiritual gifts are su- spiritual gifts are supernaturally empowered abilities given to the church through its members to enable the church to fulfill God's purposes. A lot of people want to divide spiritual gifts between the, the supernatural gifts and the normal gifts. And that's a weak division because none of the gifts are normal. None of the gifts we can do in our own strength. All of the gifts are miraculously spirit-inspired, spirit-enabled things that we can only do because the Spirit enables us. So what we've done is that we've looked at 1 Corinthians and other passages. But later on in 1 Corinthians 12, Paul is trying to explain this image to them. He says, okay, you must understand now, what does it mean when we give different gifts to different people in the church and that you should all come together? And he says, a wonderful way of understanding it is of thinking of a body. The church is a body. In other words, in this body, you as a church member, you're either an, either an eye or you're a knee or you're a shoulder or you're a stomach. There's a job that you must do. And only you can do it. And there's not only two or three people that must do a job and then the body is healthy. What do we call someone who has eyes but the eyes are not seeing? We call him disabled. That person is disabled. What do you call someone who has eyes and they can't see and he's got ears and they don't hear and his one end is there but it's not active? We call someone like that severely disabled. And yet some people think, no, it's okay in the church if ten people do all the things. We'll just come sit here. We are the sitters. We come to church and listen. That is a severely disabled church. The strength of a church is not defined on how gifted the few are, but on whether everyone is acting in their gift in the church. You can have a fantastic worship leader and a pastor and a preacher, and the five of them are doing their best. But if the people in the church are not bringing their gifts, it's a severely disabled church. We all need to be part to make this body what God wants it to be. We've looked at two of the gifts already. We've looked at utterance of wisdom. And we say this is when God comes and we are stuck. We don't know what to do. We look at the Bible and we say, you know what? This specific situation is just not dealt with in the Bible. What must we do? And then God, through someone in the church, bring the message to say, this is what you must do. He's wisdom for our difficulties. And suddenly when you hear it, it's like, of course, this is exactly the solution we're looking for. It's in line with His Word. It's honoring to God. It's for the common good. This is what we need to do. Utterances of wisdom. Where is this needed? We said, for instance, in church business meetings, this is severely needed. Maybe severely is not the right word. This is really needed. That when we are dealing with the, with the administrative things about the church and difficult challenges that the church face, we want to hear God's wisdom into the situation. It's also needed for the financial decisions of a church. Lord, you've given us this money now. What must we do with it? What is your will how this money must be spent? We need that wisdom for dealing with issues in town. 
Later I'm going to mention some of the issues that, that we as a church need to deal with in town. We need that wisdom to make the choices even though it doesn't feel like that is how other people are doing it. Does that make sense? We, for many years, I think, Renee, three, four years, we tried to get our Sunday school going. We will have King's Kids Week in June, and we have 80 kids there. And what we do is we get, get the names down, and we take all the people who say we live in Stillby, but we don't go to a church. We don't try to steal other churches' kids. Let them be blessed where they are. But we see, okay, this kid says they live in Stillby, but they don't go to a church. Then we contact those parents and say, listen, we have a Sunday school at our church. Please join us. And everyone is like, oh, this is a fantastic idea. I'm definitely sending my kid there. Not one single kid came because of it. The only kids that were there were the small group in our church. So for four or five years, we sat with, I think at the maximum, we once hit six kids in our Sunday school. Man, what a joyous day that was. And then we heard wisdom from God to say, cancel Sunday school, start Friday school. And you know what? Some people who are used to tradition will say, that's not how you do it. The Bible is very clear. Kids must have Sunday school. I'm going, no. <laughs> and we canceled Sunday school. And we started on a Friday. And on a good Friday, we now have 50 kids there. A quarter of this school comes to our King's Kids. And we work now with other churches in town doing it with us. They ask, can we join you? Because we see what God, God is doing here is a good thing. And that's often what words of wisdom is. It's something that you, you wouldn't, wouldn't do by yourself because you'd be nervous. But when you get a revelation from God, like, take this step now, then you do it. Another place where words of utterance of wisdom, message of wisdom is needed, like I said before, is in counseling. You sit with someone and they have a massive problem and they don't know how to deal with it. And you don't know as a counselor, don't know how to deal with it. And you pray and you say, God, we need your wisdom. What is needed in this situation to solve this problem? Then the second one we looked at was utterances of knowledge. And we said, you can't defi decide for yourself what it is. You have to get your definition from the Bible. And if we look at Corinthians, the book itself, 1 Corinthians, he gives us an example of utterance of knowledge. And the primary thing of utterance of knowledge is words given to the church that get us to know Jesus better. Those are the words that break the Bible open to us and we get a deep understanding of God. So for the Corinthians it was, we are stuck. It's idol worshippers and now there's meat in the idol worshippers and the words of knowledge arrives, idols are nothing. God is the only God. What a relief. What a fantastic, wow God, this is all immaterial. It's all about you. So primarily, utterances of knowledge are those words that make the Bible the Bible. Whoa! It makes the Bible alive in your heart. That makes Jesus, makes a fire burn in your heart for Him. That's utterances. But we say it's secondary. Is not, we're not excluding it. Secondary, words of knowledge are always also knowing something that is unknown. Um, we have examples in the Bible where Peter looks at Ananias and Sapphira and say, you are lying. The only way he knew it was because the Holy Spirit told him. It seems like this is a gift. The secondary part of it is a gift that Spurgeon also had. Spurgeon definitely had the first part of it as well. Man, he said things in a way that made your heart burn. But he also had this gift of unknowing. He once pointed to a guy in his church and says, Those, let me not point at someone, those gloves in your pocket, you did not pay for it. And he only knew it because God told it to him. And it was true. And there are other examples of that as well, that God gave him the ability to know the things. And what we said last week is that if we look at the Bible, the, the utterances of knowledge, the secondary part of it, is often in association with sin. God is revealing to me that you are busy with stuff that's not honoring to him. And then, <gasps> I thought nobody knew. God always knows. There's nothing we can hide from him. And if, it's for the, if it harms the church, he's going to bring it to light. And if it's for the common good of the church, he will bring it to light. Okay, so where is this needed? Utterance of knowledge is needed everywhere. I hope that when I preach, you pray that I will say utterance of knowledge. That I don't just stand here talking, talking, and you go home and nothing changed in your heart. That I will say something that will flick that switch in your heart and make you love God more. Also needed in Bible studies, when we break open God's word. It's needed 
when you forward a WhatsApp so that you only send on good WhatsApps, you need to realize the more WhatsApps you send, the smaller the chances that the people are going to read it. So make sure that what I send is really what needs to be sent for that person at this time to get their heart to love God and worship Him. And so this week, we are getting to our next one, which is faith. Now, I'm just to remind you, it's from 1 Corinthians 12, 28. We read there in verse 9, to another, faith by the same Spirit. One thing we see over and over when he talks about gifts, that there are no gifts that are given to everyone. But now we look at it and say, but how does it work that only some people are given faith? Don't we all need faith? Don't we all need faith to be saved? And what we're going to see shortly is that you get two categories of faith. There's a certain faith that all believers should have, and there's a certain type of faith, a category of faith, that are only given to those as a gift. So what we are going to do, again, is ask the four questions of this spiritual gift. What is it? What are the dangers? So how will Satan try to abuse this in the church? How will Satan come in and tell lies about this gift so that we fall off and not do this for the common good of the church? Number three is, how does it renew us? Why is it there? Why did God give this to the church? And then the fourth one, what must we now do? We want to be active about the gifts. What must we now do? So before we look at those questions, let's just pray together. Father, how wonderful to think that you took us in as enemies. You opened your hand of salvation to people who did not deserve it. And you brought us into your family. You adopted us as children. And not just that, you promised us eternal life. And not just that, Lord, you give gifts to us through your Spirit. Lord, how wonderful to know that there is not a single believer sitting here today who has not received a gift from you. So Lord, our prayer as we go through this series is that you'll help us to see and to identify, but what is my gift or gifts that you've given to me and how must I use it? How must I use it to glorify you and for the common good of the church? Lord, we desire for you to work. We do not have the power to enable you or to switch you on or to get these gifts going. It's gifts you give. But Lord, let us use it in obedience. Let us not hold back when we should act. So Lord, we pray all of this in your wonderful name. Amen. Amen. So let's look at the first question. What is it? We said there are two categories of faith. The first one is believer's faith. And then there's the gift of faith. Some people would call this the grace of faith. This is required of all people. But then there's the gift of faith that's just given to some. Um, how some people would d divide this is to say, there's a faith we all should have, and that's the faith that's enough to get saved. So you need enough, enough faith to be get saved. But there's a special group of people, they have the ability to trust God for things. In other words, these are the people that they never worry about food. Because God has given them the gift to trust Him that He will always provide for them. That is not a correct division. And we're going to see why now as we look at Ephesians. Ephesians 2 verse 8 to 10 says, For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God. Not a result of work so that no man may boast. This is believer's faith. This is the faith that says, you know what, I have a massive burden of sin. I, I was just providential that, that Bruce mentioned that in his prayer. We do it in Pilgrim's Progress where the pictures of this guy having this heavy burden on him. And that's a realization that every person who will get saved must come to. That my sin is massive. And then you think, no, nah, it's not that bad. I spoke to someone the other day and we were dealing with this and they said, no, I haven't sinned yet today. I'm thinking, you don't know what sin is. Some people would really say this, but I'm not as bad as that guy. I love how Ray Comfort does this. He comes to someone and says, you, would you agree with me, the Ten Commandments, they're the big ones? Okay, so have you ever used the Lord's name in vain? Yes. So you're a blasphemer. Have you ever stolen something? Even just, and then normally the young people would say, oh, no, no, I've never stolen something. Have you downloaded music from the internet? Okay, I've stolen something, yes, okay. Have you ever... Cheated on your spouse. Well, I'm not married. Well, God says if you look at a woman in lust, you've cheated. Okay, I've done it. Okay, so now you're a blasphemer and a thief and an adulteress. Um, have you ever told a lie? He says, yeah, no, I've, I'm sure I've told many lies. 
He says, well, you're telling me you're good, but you're admitting to the fact that you're a lying, thieving, adulterous, blasphemer. That's who will stand before God one day. I cannot come to God and say, you know, I wasn't that bad. He says, you were evil from day one until the end. We cannot come to God in our own righteousness and expect to be let in. The good news is that there is a way to be saved. That Jesus came and did what we couldn't do. He was perfect. If Ray Comfort had to stop Jesus on the streets, says, have you ever blasphemed? Never. Have you ever stolen? Never. Have you ever lied? Never. Have you ever looked at a woman in lust? Never. And Ray Comfort would go, well, you must be Jesus then. Because that's who Jesus was. He was the one that was perfect so that he could earn righteousness through his perfection. And you know what he did with that righteousness? He opened his hands and says, come, take part. Come get. And you know what? Faith is not just knowing that there is a God. The devils know there's a God. We're not going to see them in eternity. Faith is coming. It's often in the Bible that the, the parallels of faith is coming to Jesus. It's following Jesus. It's taking that step. It's coming to Jesus and says, I repent. I turn my back on that old life. I come to you now and I receive this free gift of salvation. And a lot of people say, no, no, you can't say that. You can't say that you must do something because now you earn it. Now let's look at the story of the, the, the Lord's Supper. Jesus gave them the bread and they ate it. Do you think they can walk out there and say, you know, you should have seen how I earned that bread. Man, I was fantastic. They did nothing to earn it. They got it as a gift, but they had to take it. There was a step needed them, a step of faith to say, yes, Jesus, I'm turning back on my old life and I'm choosing you now. And that's what it is. That's what faith is. And I think most people would agree that's the faith that is needed by anyone who wants to go into eternity with Jesus. If you do not have that faith, you lost. But where a lot of people are wrong is that they think that believer's faith ends there. It doesn't. Because the passage carries on and says, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So he's saying there's something true of all believers, that the moment you are saved by faith, there are things you have to do. And you're going to need faith to be able to do it. There's a type of faith that's added to believers' faith to say, I don't just trust God for salvation. I trust Him for everything He says I must trust Him for. So that's why a lovely definition of believers' faith is trusting in Christ for salvation as well as trusting Him for everything else the Bible says we must trust Him for. In other words, it can't just be some that say, you know what, that guy... He never fears where his food will come from tomorrow because he trusts that God will provide for him. That should be true of all believers because it's in God's word. God says, trust me, I will provide for you. It's not just for some. That's basic faith. So if this believer's faith is taking God at his word, doing whatever is required in his word and trusting that his word is true, that I must do what I must do and that he will do what he will do. So what is the gift of faith then? The gift of faith is the Spirit-enabled knowledge and ability to trust that God will do something that is not explicitly specified in the Bible. That's a whole mouthful. But once again, it says the Spirit comes to a person and He gives him the knowledge, so now you will know this, and He gives him the ability to say, you know what, there is something God is going to do, and I'm telling it to you, and I need you to walk in faith. I need you to start praying for this thing. But this thing is not explicitly specified in the Bible. We should all grow in believer's faith to trust in God for the things He said we must trust Him for. But this gift refers to things that are not explicitly stated in the Bible. For instance, George Mueller, I think you all know, many of you would know about George Mueller. George Mueller lived from 1805 to 1898, and he provided for thousands of orphans by means of the faith principle which meant he would look to God and never directly ask another person for money, nor did he ever borrow money for anything. He was renowned for peaceful trust in God's provision, even when a deadline loomed and food was short. On his faith principle, he raised 110,000 pounds, which was massive in those days, to build five orphan houses that accommodated 2,050 orphans. In his lifetime, he cared for 10,024 orphans. Now we go, man, this guy had the gift of faith. George Mueller was very adamant. 
I don't have the gift of faith. He said, all I'm doing is trusting God for the things that everyone should trust Him for. God says, look after the orphans. He's not going to tell us to do something we can't do. So I can do it and I can trust Him for it. God said we can trust Him for provision in His Word. This is not a special gift of faith. This is basic believer's faith. And His desire always was that everyone would follow His example. This is standard believer's faith. For instance, He says, I don't have the gift of faith. God does not reveal to me certain things that will happen. His wife got very sick. And He prayed and hoped and asked God to heal her. And He was hoping that she would be healed. But she died. And he stood up at her, at her funeral and he preached a fantastic sermon on how good God is. He says, God never revealed to me that my wife will get better. And that's what the gift of faith is. That is when God comes to someone and says, there's no promise in the Bible that everyone will always be healthy and everyone that is sick will get better. That's a promise for eternity. But in this world, there's no promise like that. But God can come to someone and say, you know what? That person... I am going to heal. And I need you to go pray for them. And I need you to make this known that I'm going to heal this person and pray for them. Gerard de Toy is coming soon to speak at a week of prayer here for us. And I remember one story he told was that he knew these two ladies. I think it was an Armanus. And they would pray all day long. They have these boards in front of them full of names, full of names. And they would pray. And it's all lost people. And they would pray for them and pray. For them. And then they would call him in and they say, this guy is going to be saved tonight. Go to his house and go tell him about Jesus. Because they had the, the gift of faith that God revealed to them. You've prayed for this person now for 10 years. Tonight is the night. Go to his house and preach. That is a fantastic gift. Can you think if that gift becomes active in a church, how much trust we will have in God? So the gift of faith is not that I choose that a person will get better and I gather enough faith around and because I, my bag of faith is big enough when I pray for that person, they get healed. That is so self-centered. I do not have the ability to gather an inch, a, a grain of sand of faith by myself. Faith is a gift from God. So the gift that God reveals this is what I'm going to do. And I'm giving you the ability to believe me and trust me and to walk in this path and to do it. So what's happening is that God is revealing his unknown will to you. His known will is in the word. I will look after my children. I'm coming again. All those things we must trust him for. But sometimes we don't know. God, we're starting a ministry. Will this be successful? Is this part of your will? We need to know your will in this. And then God comes through the, the gift of faith and says, this is my will. Go for it. When you start understanding that, then suddenly so much of the Bible starts making more sense. Um, Matthew twenty one twenty two says, And whatever you ask in prayer, you will receive if you have faith. The parallel passage says, And this is the confidence that we have toward Him, that if we ask anything according to His will, He hears us. Do you see? Suddenly it makes sense. It's not when I gather a big enough bag of faith that God is going to answer my prayer. It's if I've been given the gift of faith into that situation. And I pray in the gift of faith, then God hears. Because that's exactly what John says. According to His will. So His will has been revealed to me in this situation. And therefore, when I pray in that will, I can have confidence that this is what He will do. Another passage. James 5, 14 to 15. If is anyone among you sick, let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick and Lord will raise him up. Now we go, you know what? The elders went and they did everything right and they prayed for a person and the person got better. And then they went and they did the exact same thing with the same amount of faith and they prayed for the next person and that person died. And then you think, but we did the same thing. We trusted in God. We actually trusted more because we saw Him working a miracle the first time and then the second time, it just didn't work. Because it's the prayer of faith. It's a prayer that operates in the gift of faith. God reveals, I am going to heal this person. Here is the faith to know it. Here is the gift. Pray in this gift for this person and they will be healed. So once again, like I said, it's the, the, the prayer of faith. So what are the dangers? Now we know what it is. It's a gift of God revealing His will, enabling us to trust Him in a specific situation. What are the dangers? The dangers are, 
Firstly, ignoring this gift. We can think like the world and miss out. Well, this person is very sick. Doctor said that's the end, there's nothing to do, and the church goes, oh well, if the doctor said it, it must be true. No, 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 what did God say? Have we asked Him yet? He said, God, we as a church come together. Tell us, reveal to us whether this person will be ill. It doesn't mean we don't pray until we've heard. We always pray. Because just like with those ladies, it's often as we pray, as we pray, as we pray, then God reveals, I am going to heal this person. Or God reveals, I am not going to heal that person. You know many old people, old sickly people I've prayed for that says, no, 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 don't pray for healing. God has shown me I'm going to die. And it, and it takes us back because that's just not how it should be. We must pray for healing. No, I've got peace. God revealed to me I'm not going to get better from this. They receive the gift of faith that this is God's will for me to go. And they have peace with it. So the first thing is to ignore this gift. This person has cancer. They will die. And if you get them chemo, they might live six months. And then that person in the church decides not to get chemo. And then how many years later, Eve is still with us. So, there we go. And you know what? Eve is not the only, the only one. When I told Renee about this, she said, but don't, you must mention this person and this person and this person. They're going to be there the whole day if I need to mention everyone who's had that miraculous healing from God when the doctor said it's done. So that's the danger when we start ignoring this gift is that we operate like the world. Well, that person is sick. We're not going to pray for them anymore. In the meantime, God is wanting to raise up that person. So let's be sensitive to his voice. The second danger is acting beyond this gift. You know, it's easy to make faith claims. Oh, of course, that person is going to get better. And how sad it is when it doesn't come true. When a whole family comes around a person, they say, God has revealed to us that this, our child will get better. And then the child dies. And it is not for the common good of the church. It harms the church. So what do we do? I've heard so many times, like I said, of people telling someone will get better and they don't. Or someone telling them, God says, you must have faith, you will have a child. And they never have a child. I, a while back I heard of a pastor who in faith decided to build this massive church building because God said in faith they must do it and he will provide. And the money never came in. And this pastor committed suicide by hanging himself in the church because the burden of debt was just too much. It is a scary thing if we move beyond this gift. And Romans 12 warns us in relation to this gift. He says, don't start thinking too much of yourself. Thinking, thinking the faith decisions lie with me. Oh, well, God, I think we should heal that person. So I'm going to make a faith statement that that person will be healed. Who are you? It's God. It's Him. He's the wise one. He's the mighty one. He's the revealer of His will. So if that happens, you move from your gift into arrogance and thinking you have the right to decide. So how do we avoid moving beyond what God has done? Well, Romans makes it very clear and he says, test it test it. Often people say, well, this is going to happen. And if you start questioning, it's like, oh, you don't have faith. You're now standing against God. I'm saying, no, no, I have faith because the Bible says I must test it. I'm having faith in that verse of the Bible. The Bible says test things. Don't just accept things. There's deception. There's a de there's, there are demons. The devil is there. He's going to try to warp this thing. So make sure, make sure some signs that this might not be your gift is that you always believe God will do a miracle. Whenever someone's sick, you're the first one to say, no, no, God said this person's going to get better. And after a while, people are going to say, listen, we don't know who you're listening to, but you're not listening to God. Another thing that might show you that, that this is not your gift is when you're emotionally involved. You don't really care about other people being sick. But when your child is sick, then suddenly you develop this gift and say, no, no, God said my child will be better. This is for the common good of the church. This operates in the church. And sometimes God will tell you, your child will die, but that person's child will live. And it's his will and it's his purpose. So those, those are the dangers. How does it renew us? Proven faith grows our trust in God. Why? I'm, I'm guessing, but I think I'm guessing correctly. Why is it that Eve is always first here to say something? You don't get healed twice from cancer that they gave you a death sentence and be quiet about it. When God proves himself in revealing faith and bringing it through, you just bubble over and you can't stop thanking him. And you can't stop worshipping him. And that's why it's for the common good of the church. I can't just always be happy what about what's happening to me. 
I need to be in the church when God does a faith miracle in that person's life that I rejoice with them. Okay. So, proven faith grows our trust in God. We need people with the utterance of wisdom to say, there's the road that God wants us to take. But we also need people with the gift of faith to say, let's go. I'm taking the lead. I'm praying for this. I'm doing this. Let's do this. So what directions are we facing at Still Bay Baptist where we need wisdom and faith? Firstly, we, we believe there's a dire need for biblical counseling in this town. And by biblical counseling, we mean not worldly counsel. We believe there are so many people who are struggling with depression, struggling with family issues, struggling with all these things. And we feel God has called us as a church to help, to be involved there. How? We don't know yet. I'm studying at the moment. Erna studied her degree. Many other people are, are taking up. God is steering us in the direction. And we're going to need gifts of words of wisdom where God says, okay, do that. Okay, okay go in this direction. We're going to need gifts of faith where people say, you know what? God says, I'm going to bless that thing. Go in there. Trust for it. Pray for it. And do it. Other things. Growing drug and alcohol problem. And please don't think it's a Malkut Fontaine problem. Malkut Fontaine has a visible problem. Still by as a hidden problem. And if you talk to anyone, the police, the social workers, they will tell you, don't think it's bigger in Malkut Fontaine. We just have more money to hide it. We just have family members with more money who can hide the people with trouble. That's a massive growing tr problem. Ten years, fifteen years ago, drugs was a minor problem. Yeah, alcoholism has always been a problem. But it's growing rapidly. God, what must we do? God, what do you want to do? Reveal your will. We want to follow you. The third one is, we feel that there's a, there, there's a crowd missing in the church. From here when people leave school until they have small children, those people are gone. And we are very thankful for the small handful that are here. But most of them are gone. They grew up in the church all their lives, many of them. And then they're just gone. God, reveal your will on how to reach them. God, reveal your will on getting your truth and your love to them. We need these gifts. Do you see how weak we will be as a church if we just operate on our own? On our own, well, well, let's have a braai. We had a braai, nothing happened. People left the church after the braai, actually, coming to think of it. So, and that's fine, because we tested it, and it didn't work. And we're saying, okay, God, what do you want to do? Show us, reveal, give us that gift of faith to say, man, if you walk in this way, I'm going to bless you by reaching the young people in this town. So what must we now do? Pray for this gift. Pray for this gift to be active in this church so we can do God's will. Share your gift. If this is your gift, um, you need to share it. And you might be nervous about, but what if I'm wrong? What if I make this claim and then it proves not to be right? Well, it's not wrong to test God in this and to come to the church and say, you know what? I feel God is revealing this gift of faith, but I'm not sure. I, I might be deceived. Please walk the path with me. Please pray with me and see if this is really his will. And eventually you grow in your gifting and you start to discern between your voice, your heart's voice, and the voice of God. The third one is act in humility. Let us never make this arrogant faith statements like salvation belongs to us. And then the fourth one is cultivate believer's faith. Because you must realize a lot of what I've spoken about now might not be active in you. You might, like George Mueller said, you know, I did all these things for God, but he never revealed his specific will to me. And that's fantastic, because he still had believer's faith. And that's the thing we all need, to look at God's word and say, it's there, you said it, I believe it, I'm going to do it. And not have to worry and doubt and live in fear. And we are in fear in our country for what's happening. I get SMSs and messages, and now the, they're going to take this farm and that farm, and I look and my God says, I will provide. I will be with you. I will stop the work of evil ones. And even when I don't, eternity is waiting and that's fantastic. And we have to stop, let the world define how our inner beings are doing. And let God's word define how we should be feeling and living and walking in faith in this world. Hebrews 11 is a fantastic chapter in conclusion, about people who had this, this gift of faith. Abram living here in a strange land, with it, well, for him it wasn't strange, it was his land. He lived there and God says, go, go over there. He didn't find it in God's word. God says, go. And he went in faith. 
And God blessed him. Noah, sitting there happily, God says, build an ark. Rain is coming. Really? Word of faith. And he did it. And God blessed him. None of them said, God, I want to go to that land because you must give that land to me and I'm going to do it in faith. They waited for God to give them the gift of faith to say, go man, I will be with you. So is this you? Have you ever found that God reveals something to you and then it comes true? And you go, wow, God, why, why did this happen? Please don't keep it to yourself. If you're wondering about it, come chat to the elders. Come chat to someone. Come chat to me and say, God, I think this is something that God is doing in my life. Um, how can I use it for the church? And let's not hold back. Let's not be a severely disabled church. Let's be the body of God here in Stilby. Let's pray together. Lord, how wonderful to know that all your gifts are miraculous. Lord, when left to ourselves and what we can bring together, we will fail every time. The job is too difficult. The call is too big. And you knew that. That's why you gave us the Spirit. That's why you gift us with your gift, so that we can be who we need to be for your purposes to be fulfilled. Lord, your desire is for many to be saved. Your desire is for many more to come in and accept this gift, your open arms, your, your love, your truth, your salvation. Lord, use us as instruments in your hand to get that message out. Lord, use us as instruments in each other's lives so that when we are fearful, that you will speak in boldness to us, that we can trust you. And Lord, even if it's not the gift, but it's just good, normal faith, it's fantastic, Lord. And help us to grow in that. Help us to trust you more and more every day for the things you say in your word. Your word does not lie, Lord. Help us to hold on to that. We pray all of this in your wonderful name. Amen. Amen.